This is the Orlando Sentinel Editorial Board interview with candidates for Circuit Judge and Circuit 9 Group 44. I thank you both for joining us, and we will get started with the questions. Scott, did you want to lead us off? Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, both for uh, joining us today. Uh, one of the things I have learned about uh, most uh, lawyers who run for judge is that they run because at some point in time they've been in a courtroom and thought they could do something better than the judge who uh, they were standing before. I am curious uh, what each of you thought uh, when you were have been practicing, uh, what you think the problems are uh, when it comes to judges, whether it's temperament or manners or knowledge of the law. What, what, what do you think you've seen are problems with uh, judges and that you think you could do better? And I'll go alphabetically. Mr. Bartolone, start with you. Thank you, Scott, and thank you both for having us on. Um, one of the reasons that I decided to become a judge or run for judge um, was after practicing for almost 23 years, you know, I was able to, uh, I've had the opportunity to present in front of various state courts and federal courts. And I was somewhat astonished by, you know, the slew of young lawyers or young judges that had been appointed to the bench with, who had very limited experience. Um, you know, you I think a lawyer has to have a very diverse background, not only in terms of length of experience, but diversity of cases. I I started my career at the public defender's office where I obviously was worked for the government. I then went on to work in a couple of large firms where I did uh, commercial litigation and insurance defense. I, I worked at a small boutique practice and then eventually went off on my own. So I, I've been on all sides of it. I've represented the Fortune 500 companies down to the mom and pop businesses and the individuals. And I think what is lacking on the bench is just that. It's that it's that compassion. It's that that you learn from clients. And I've had the the pleasure of you know representing over a, a thousand families and, and small businesses in Florida. And I think I've learned more from them uh, than I did all throughout law school. They're, they taught me what it means, what justice means to each of them. And I think that's what's lacking on the bench is that is that level of empathy or compassion. Okay. I think that's something I can bring to the bench. Thank you very much. And Judge Chu, I won't ask you to dish on your colleagues uh, per se, but I presume there was a point in time when you appeared uh, in courtrooms and, and what did you see as issues that you thought you maybe you could do better than judges in the district? Sure. Um, well, I, again, I, I I think we have a wonderful bench in the Ninth Circuit, um, and I had the privilege for um, a lot of years, um, for about 15 years, to practice in front of a number of judges, but in particular, a lot of our federal judges. Uh, so it's not so much a matter of seeing what's lacking, uh, but I mean, I think what I, I do know that I think we struggle with uh, in the, on the state benches are preparation and self-awareness. Uh, as far as preparation, I, and this really bears out in hearing sometimes, lawyers will ask me for an hour uh, for something. And I'm like, this should take 15 minutes. And I'll say, well, what if I read everything before before the hearing? Uh, how long do you need? And they'll be like, well, we need 15 minutes. Um, so, I mean, that tells me that, that, is a, that there is a systemic problem sometimes that lawyers at least are perceiving that the judges aren't doing the preparation um, you know, for the cases. I don't know that that's necessarily the case in the ninth, but uh, that is, a, I think, a perception. The other thing is self-awareness, um, the willingness to be told that you're wrong, the willingness to potentially put on uh, someone else's lens. And I think that is, we talk about robitis, and I think that's really the, the first step in the road in on the road to that is when you lack the self-awareness to question your own perspective uh, and to put on somebody else's. Great. Thank you very much. I wanted to follow up on that. Um, one of the things that judges face, um, and and at the circuit level, though not so much as at the county level, is that you do occasionally see um, people coming before you who don't have the benefit of legal counsel and who are trying to go it alone. What do you... Um, what can a judge do to help them without violating any of the um, rules that you're supposed to abide by? Um, and we'll um, start with Mr. Barlow. Thank you. So, you know, pro se litigants, it's a, it's a different breed. It's very difficult uh, for them because it's probably their first time before the court uh, with many of them. Uh, most of them are 
afraid. They don't know what to say. They don't know what arguments to make. They don't know how to communicate with the attorney on the other side if there is one, much less what arguments to make to the judge. Uh, you know, due process and access to courts uh, is not a one size fits all concept. Pro se litigants need a lot more patience. They need some guidance w within the limits of you know, the judicial requirements, as well as understanding. Uh, they often, you know, they really don't understand the legal issues and ramifications that are facing them. And I think it's the judge's job to educate them on that. You know, and, and further, because of the number of pro se litigants, and, and I'm assuming that in, you know, you know, economic times go up and down, and at some point we're going to reach another downfall where there's a lot of pro se litigants. And so I think the state really needs to increase funding for things like the Legal Aid Society so that they have a, an expanded presence in the courtroom because, you know, obviously criminal defendants are entitled to a, a public defender, but civil cases, they're not entitled to an attorney. And I think that we need to have a greater presence of Legal Aid Society. Judge Chair? Well, we actually deal with this a lot uh, in family court uh, at the circuit level. Uh, and um, you know, over the the two plus years I was in family, uh, really it was a this was one of the big challenges we faced. I think we, I'd split it into two sections. It's the work you do before the hearings and the work you do during. Before I think is perhaps even more important. Uh, so what we would do is that we would put very clear and simple to follow procedures up on the website, so that everybody would would know what the what the procedures are. And I'm not helping anybody because that's generally available knowledge we would direct those folks to those procedures with every contact. So on a notice for hearing or a scheduling contact, we direct them to the procedures uh, and, and ask them to read them. Uh, the other thing I think that's important is pro, the case law says that pro se pleadings are to be liberally construed. That means it's the judge's job to figure out what a pro se litigant is trying to say in their pleading and frame the issue for the parties to address. Uh, once we get to court, I think it's important that the judge lays the ground rules. You know what? What? How I'll do it is I'll tell people I can't tell you what the law is, I can't help you, but I will explain to them I'm not letting this evidence in because of this or that reason. Uh, so I'm not giving them advice, but I'm telling them the reason that that you know might not be coming in. Um, make sure the I make sure the opposing counsel is not taking advantage um, because every day we walk in, we walk in under those words that say equal justice under the law, and that's whether or not someone has an attorney or not. Um, and I agree, I think legal aid needs uh, more funding. Um, that funding comes from the bar associations, not from the state, but I, I do agree that um, we all as a legal community need to, to support legal aid because that is, um, you know, that, that's the way that we can make a difference. I'd like to change topics to ask about uh, specialty courts. Those are something that well, we've written about for a long time before even some of them arrived. We have them uh, for veterans, mental health, uh, drug courts. I'm curious of what your thoughts are on the role specialty courts play. Are they a good idea or should they be expanded or decreased? And Judge Chu, we can start with you. Uh, look, I think the specialty courts are um, are wonderful. And you know we have some great ones in the ninth, the DV, the problem solving courts. Um, I, I absolutely think that we should expand them um, and not just expand uh, the specialty court divisions, but increase the tools. And I think in particular uh, on the criminal side that criminal judges uh, have um, in crafting uh, sentences and crafting resolutions to cases, because look, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, you know, so for the judges to have more alternatives, um, I mean, keeping our community safe is important, but a criminal proceeding is also often an opportunity and perhaps the last opportunity to intervene in the life of someone in crisis or free fall. And that's where having, if the courts have some, judges have some tools that allow to help with mental health issues or drug uh, issues or other substance abuse issues, that's, uh, I think that makes a huge difference. Great. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Bartolome. Yes. Thank you, Scott. So I think specialty courts are in very necessary. I think they have a more profound meaning than simply uh, tools available to the judiciary. I mean, specialty courts were designed to give people second chances. I, I think that was the, on, you know, the, the idea behind the veterans court, the drug offenders court. Uh, they were at one point, there was an eviction diversion court. Uh, and these are all for the purpose of allowing somebody 
that second chance. They, uh, they are necessary to create that faith in judicial system. And so where the legislature has tied the hands of the judiciary in cases like where there's minimum mandatory sentencing uh, and, and limited departure grounds for non-minimum mandatory sentencing cases, I think that if you expand some of these, uh, the drug courts or create additional additional specialty courts, I think you're going to have more people taking advantage of that second chance to either get an education or uh, get, go through successful rehabilitation and be able to move on with a successful life than being condemned to living in the shadows. So I, I think it really is necessary to expand those specialty courts. Okay, thank you very much. Obviously, um, in Orange and Osceola counties, we are seeing um, populations of people who are non-native English speakers surging. Um, I wanted to ask what you think, whether you think courts have adequate resources to meet their needs and ensure that they are getting a fair shot at, at justice that they can understand. Um, and if you don't see that their needs are being met, how can the court system do better? And Mr. Bartlett. Thank you. So, I mean, I get a benefit of being bilingual, bilingual in English and Spanish. So I have an advantage in being able to understand a lot of these litigants directly because, you know, according to the last census, 55% of Osceola County is Hispanic and almost 33% of Orange County. I've actually been asked by judges to help interpret for pro se litigants, even though I can't interpret for the record, but simply to help them understand what the judges are saying and what some of the other attorneys are saying. You know, in, in Central Florida, we have this wonderful melting pot with so many different people. And I think the state court system needs to catch up in order to accommodate everybody. And I don't think we really need to reinvent the wheel. So the, uh, the Department of Justice actually uses a system called InterpreTalk which allows at the at, you know the dialing of a 1-800 number and although it's telephonic and less less personal you have access to over a hundred languages and dialects by using that interpret talk system within a matter of less than in less than a minute so we don't need to reinvent the wheel we maybe just need to create some additional funding to use systems like interpret talk i mean i, I agree no we don't have enough uh interpretation uh, services um, and I think, again, I'm going to go back to, to family court, where I think this is oftentimes the most pronounced, um, you know, because that's not considered under the law due process court in the sense of you're not entitled to an interpreter, unlike in criminal. And people have to provide their own interpreters. And that often comes in very widely varying qualities. And, um, you know, and that's not just with, with, with Spanish. In, in, in Central Florida, in particular, uh, Haitian Creole. Uh, is a is a dire need uh, for people, and you know the judge can't just switch over into a different language, uh, even if they speak it. And, and and frankly, what I've had to do in the past is, you know, I've had to to draft someone in the back of the courtroom, kind of like my opponent <laughs> mentioned, you know, to to serve as the interpreter because I can't have the lawyers do it, I can't do it, you know, I can't have the clerk do it. Um, so I mean, it is a uh, it's a huge problem, and I would say not just in the hearings but also in sort of the filing process leading up to it. Because if you don't understand what's going on when you're trying to file papers, if you don't understand what's going on when you're trying to navigate the courthouse, having an interpreter waiting for, waiting for you in the courtroom oftentimes isn't enough. So I, I agree. I mean, we need, we need more resources uh, that's, uh, to address that issue. Thank you very much. I wanted to switch gears and uh, ask a question about uh, sort of the uh, legal groups, the ideological legal groups or societies that uh, lawyers are sometimes members of. I think voters are paying more attention now to those affiliation than they have in years past. So I have a question for each of you that I'm gonna tweak individually. And I'll start with you, Judge Chu. If I have it correct, and please let me know if I don't, you were a member of the Federalist Society when you were appointed to the bench, but you subsequently dropped your affiliation. Can you let us know if that's accurate and sort of what your thinking was on that front, if it is? That is accurate. Um, the uh, the thinking on that front was that was an organization that was discussing uh, judicial philosophy, uh, and that was a um, an issue I was interested in and interested in hearing about. Um, I think as it went, uh, from my comfort level, it felt a little bit 
um, more um, political than I was comfortable with, uh, which is why I, I'm no longer a, a, a part of that. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Bartolone, I would sort of flip that around. I, I didn't see anything on your website, but I may have missed it. Are you a member of any ideological group, whether the Federalist Society, the American Constitution Society, any uh, group like that? Uh, generally, no, but I, I am a member of the American Constitution Society. Okay. Um, you know, that would be really the only ideological group that I'm a, a, a member of. For the most part, I'm a member of the Orange County Bar, the Osceola County Bar, the Tiger Bay uh, the Tiger Bay Group of Central Florida, but yes, I, I am a member of the American Constitution Society because I think at this point in time, uh, which is crucial in nature, they're serving a purpose. They are teaching people uh, how you know a pathway to the bench, how to get you know how to get somebody who is not ideologically similar to, let's say, our governor, how to get them on the bench. Um, as well as teaching everybody about fundamental rights and how to advocate for those things. And I think that's incredibly necessary, especially in law, uh, with what's been happening. I think it's necessary to have uh, that perspective. Okay, thank you very much. One of the very difficult um, things about becoming a judge or, or serving as a judge is that many times the focus is on you um, people are taking a look at things like what societies you you are a member of, or sometimes even where you go to church, or or um, or what your favorite leisure activities are, and and many times also you will get criticized for making rulings that might not be popular, but that are that are necessary under the law as you see it. How do you how do you handle that kind of pressure and 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 maintain an even demeanor in the courtroom when people are always trying to uh, assume that they know what you're thinking and often don't and um, we can start with Mr. Bartlow. Yes, well, I mean that should be a fairly simple answer. Is that you know whatever people want to try and uh, decipher from your background or from your memberships in various uh, organizations is entirely irrelevant to how you're going to decide on any given case. You are presented with facts. You are presented with testimony, um, documentary evidence, and that is and and the law, and that's what you're basing your decisions on. Uh, not what the public thinks of you or what they expect of you. I mean, over the course of my career, I I have taken positions that are, you know, sometimes not popular um, and sometimes it really that are uh, judges who have disliked that opinion or have, you know, it was quite oppositional. However, I did it anyway because it was necessary. So I'm kind of stubbornly independent in the sense of, I will do what needs to be done regardless of what others think. That's true. Well, it's you know funny you ask because I just came off of the heels of a um, controversial media case uh, right in the middle of a contested election. So I suppose that's like the the double uh, boiling uh, boiler pot. Um, look, the best thing a judge can can do to, is uh, to ensure that they're not the story. Uh, that that the case is the story uh and to tune out all the noise of of public opinion um and like i said i had the pet land uh or the 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 ban on uh, the retail sale of uh cats and dogs that came before me just recently and you know i i, I i'm sure that there was all kinds of stuff swirling around and um you know i i just what i tried to do is tune out the noise i mean we're not politicians uh at core uh, our job is to decide each case based upon the evidence and the law and um, you know how you handle it is that you go in every day uh, committing yourself to do just that. Thank you. All right. And at this point, I'm going to take a point of personal privilege and just say uh, thanks to both of you for uh, helping us make through, get through these topics quickly in an effective manner. I think we've uh, covered more ground in, let's see, 21 minutes with you two than we have in an hour 
with some others. So uh, thanks, thanks for that. Um, you, you just mentioned media, uh, Judge Chu. Uh, that's one thing uh, we, we're often interested in, the Sunshine Law. What, what do you think the state of uh, sort of open records is with the court uh, in Florida right now, with accessibility uh, for the public to get access to records, to rulings, to things like that? Uh, is it where it needs to be anything we can do better? In terms of the availability of information, uh, I think it's it's all out there. Uh, you know, the, I think the question you asked or the problem is really has to do with the volume of information. You know, you can look up any, you know, any ruling on any case, but I've got like, I think 2,600 cases. So um, if you're looking at, for a particular case, you can find it. If you're just trying to find general information, it's a lot more challenging. I will say our clerk of courts does a wonderful job uh, of keeping those records, uh, and, and frankly, it never it rarely has to come to sort of a sunshine law request because, um, at least here in the Ninth Circuit, uh, our clerks, both of our clerks, uh, really do a good job of making those records freely available. Um, so it it really is just a it, it's more of a logistical problem of sifting through all of it uh, to get what you need. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Bartolone, you, you, you're on the other side of the uh, bench. Uh, how do you see uh, in terms of access to court records and could anything be done better? Well, I actually agree. I mean, I, I think that both clerks and Orange and Osceola have done a pretty good job. It's, rel you know, the websites are relatively user-friendly. Um, most documents or most non-confidential documents are easily available with, uh, you know, with entering into the websites. And I think now, especially with a growing younger generation who is extremely apt uh, in terms of computer savvy, I think the, it, it's very easy for them to find, you know, whatever decisions, pleadings, uh, and any other documents that have been filed in the, in the cases. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and speaking of the young ones, <laughs> um, COVID, brought everybody into the era of technology, whether we wanted to be there or not. Um, and I think people have discovered um, that there are many ways of, of conducting court business. And, you know, should we ever head back toward what we would consider to be normal? Um, do you think courts should continue to offer remote appearances, um, uh, hearings by by Google Meet or Teams or Zoom, um, and and that possibility of access other than showing up in the courtroom. And we will start with Mr. Bylan because. As a private practitioner, I can tell you that it's fantastic. I mean, although the pandemic was a catastrophe, uh, the access to Zoom or Microsoft Teams hearings for non-evidentiary matters has been a blessing. It's not just easier for us, uh, but it saves for the clients because if you're billing them by the hour, you don't have to travel to the courthouse, pay for parking, which gets passed on to them and, and come back. So they are literally just paying you for the work you're doing. And for us, it allows us to be in several counties at the same time where you don't have to worry about scheduling issues in terms of having to be in Lake County and then in a half hour be in Orange County and then down in Osceola. So I think it's been wonderful. However, I can say that for uh, evidentiary matters, I think that still needs to be in person because when you're evaluating the credibility of a witness um, or uh, the veracity of evidence. I think that still needs to be done in person. I've done Zoom trials and I don't really care for them, but the majority of hearings are not evidentiary in nature. And I think that the Zoom hearings have been quite the blessing for, for us practitioners. Uh, I agree. I mean, for, you know, at, at, the, at least for the division I run, this is the new normal. Um, and for the most part, the default uh, our uh, remote uh, video hearings, because most of, in, in civil in particular, most of the hearings are non-evidentiary. Uh, we're, we're arguing about a point of law uh, and it, the, the amount of um, efficiency it creates for people, the cost uh, savings for uh, lawyers, for litigants, the, the, the change has just been a monumental shift. And that includes even allow, being able to have witnesses testify uh, remotely, which has been a game changer uh, in jury trials, 
uh, even because when you have a crowded docket, you don't have to worry about getting your expert to fly across the country. Um, and all of those cost savings, really what that results in is access to justice for more people because then getting legal help costs less uh, and more people are able to afford it. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, this, you know, this, a, a lot of this, uh, this technology is here to stay uh, and it's for the better. Um, unless Scott, you had anything else, um, I would say, and I definitely endorse what Scott said, with remarkable efficiency and and uh, yet very comprehensive answers, you have we've covered more ground than we have with any other with any other pair of judicial candidates. Um, but I'd like to now invite you to each give a brief closing statement that would let people know why you should be the their choice in this race. Um, and we will start with our challenger. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with all of you. Um, and, and really, we're at a crucial time where the public confidence and the trust in the judiciary is waning, and, and that's for a good reason. Uh, the people deserve judges that are committed to protecting the fundamental rights of our residents and to improving the manner in which justice is served. Uh, it's not simply serving political or special interests. Yeah in meeting out justice. In order to achieve that end, it takes real experience. I mean, I've tried dozens of jury trials and non-jury trials across the spectrum of cases, everything from criminal, personal injury, commercial and business disputes to foreclosures and bankruptcy cases. Uh, and I've appeared before countless judges in both states and federal court. Uh, even more importantly, I've, I've had the honor of representing over a thousand families and businesses in Central Florida uh, where I learned what justice means to each of them, not just the, what I learned in a vacuum in law school. So it's a judge's job to fairly and impartially apply the law. However, that dedication to the law has to be accompanied by faithfulness to the people. Uh, I've proven over nearly 23 years of practice that I have the skill, knowledge, temperament, and, and compassion to sit on the bench. Um, and I thank you all for the time, and I look forward to your votes on August 23rd. I think I, I bring three things in particular to the table. Uh, first is a commitment to public service, uh, relevant experience, and proven performance. Um, you know, I've spent the last 18 years uh, serving uh, the community uh, as a, you know, as a state and federal prosecutor and now as a judge. Uh, I've spent, uh, you know, and I think one of the things you want to know is how many jury trials, jury trials has someone tried and recently? Look, I've spent 18 years in the courtroom. I've tried about 50 jury trials as an attorney, mostly complex and high profile cases. And I've been, I was trying jury trials right up to the point uh, that I took the bench. By contrast, my opponent's been practicing primarily bankruptcy law for the past 15 years, which doesn't involve juries. Now, I also have experience both in, in family, civil, and criminal cases, which is really the large bulk of what a circuit judge does. And finally, you don't have to guess what kind of judge I'm going to be, because there's almost three years of tape, uh, of tape on me as a judge. Uh, and you know, after those three years, I, I stand here. I've got about I think 200 endorsements. I've got overwhelming support from the family bar. These are lawyers who practice in front of me every day for over two years. Uh, I have support from the civil bar. Uh, in fact, when they ranked uh, the Central Florida trial lawyers, did an anonymous ranking of judges, 54 judges in Central Florida. I came in third, and the person who came in second is out in Brevard. Um, so in a time where it feels like no one can agree on anything, you know, I have support from disparate groups that don't often agree on much. Criminal defense attorneys and law enforcement officials like Sheriff Mina. I've got the support of unions like the AFL-CIO and the firefighters, as well as the business community like the West Orange uh, Political Alliance and partners at large law firms. I've got support from plaintiff's attorneys and civil defense attorneys. And the people that are out supporting me, walking in parades, knocking on doors, a lot of these folks are the, my former opponents in court and the people that have been standing in front of me for the last uh, several years. I have the overwhelming support of the legal community, including a number of attorneys that my opponent has worked for and with. And the reason for that is because the contrast between us couldn't be more stark and the choice couldn't be more clear. Uh, and that's why I uh, ask the uh, citizens uh, of Orange and Osceola County to vote for me uh, in August. Thank you very much.